Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, Forum. Uh, my name is Phil Sharp. I'm acting director of the Institute of Politics. And we're very pleased tonight to present the uh, fellows that are here at the Institute of Politics this semester. We call this forum Profiles in Leadership. As you know, the Kennedy School of Government has, as, a, as part of its mission, to try to train leaders for this country and indeed around the world. And one of the contributions that the Institute of Politics is able to make to that mission, and indeed to the entire university community, is to bring folks who are in leadership positions or have been in leadership positions uh, in our political and public uh, arenas uh, to the school. They spend time here. They run study groups that you can attend and engage with them in conversations about critical topics. Uh, even more importantly for some students is the opportunity to talk with them on an individual basis uh, as they uh, are here so that you can find out what their lives are like, what issues they have faced, what troubles they have had to conquer, uh, things that matter to people trying to be engaged in public service here or around the world. And it's my pleasure, I will first introduce each of them, and then we'll ask them a couple questions. And then, as you may know, unlike usual forums where an audience is able to ask questions, something we actually insist upon always in the forum, uh, you will be able to ask them more directly and engage with them more directly because we will bring uh, this part to a close. We will have setups around the room where you can, uh, in a sense, shop from one to the other uh, and engage with them and find out more about their study groups and uh, what they will be doing. This semester, we are very pleased to have such a rich uh, variety of experiences and, and uh, 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 backgrounds and topics uh, that are going to be available uh, to you folks. Uh, uh, let me introduce our first, which is the uh, uh, former Chief Justice uh, uh, Jeffrey Amstoy. Uh, uh, Justice Amstoy was um, Attorney General for uh, uh, Vermont from 1974 to 1981. Uh, 1984, he ran for Attorney General of Vermont and was reelected six times. He was appointed by Governor Howard Dean as the 37th Chief Justice of Vermont's Supreme Court in 1997, and he put Vermont and the issue of gay marriage on the political map with his court ruling in 1999. That decision, Baker versus State, uh, held that same-sex couples were constitutionally entitled to the rights and benefits of marriage, and as you well know, that has become a topic of intense interest uh, throughout the United States. Uh, but we're also told that his greatest accomplishment is, in fact, that in 1982, he obtained his master's degree here at the Kennedy School of Government. We're very proud to welcome Chief Justice Jeffrey Amistoy. <clears throat> Next to him is Dr. Susan Blumenthal. Uh, she is a clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown and Tufts School of Medicine. Uh, she is a distinguished uh, visiting professor of women's studies at Brandeis University and a visiting professor at Stanford University in Washington, D.C. Uh, she served as indeed was the first uh, deputy assistant secretary for women's health in the United States. Uh, and it should be noted that thanks to her efforts, uh, women's health issues were brought to the forefront on the national agenda after a long, in fact, political struggle in the United States Congress and elsewhere. Uh, and indeed, she has helped to advance significantly the dialogue on what should be the priorities in national medical research. Uh, currently, she is the U.S. Assistant Surgeon General and Senior Medical E-Health Advisor uh, at the, in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So, um, uh, and, and I should add, um, a former... A, I'm a former member of Congress, a colleague of mine formerly uh, was, is the man to whom she's married, uh, who is Congressman Ed Markey from here in Massachusetts. Please welcome Rear Admiral Susan Blumenthal. <clears throat> and next we have Ambassador Barbara Bodine. She spent uh, 30 years in diplomatic service, primarily in the Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula. She was Deputy Principal Officer in Baghdad from 1980 to 1983, and Deputy Chief of Mission in Ku Kuwait during the Iraqi invasion and the occupation in 1990. 
She was ambassador to Yemen from 1997 to 2001, and after the USS Cole was attacked, she worked to enhance the security cooperation between Yemen and the United States and promoted democratization efforts within Yemen. In 2003, she was appointed coordinator for post-conflict reconstruction for Baghdad. I'm not sure if <laughs> post-reconstruction is the word at the moment. Uh, and, uh, and the central regions of uh, Iraq. More recently, she served as senior advisor for international security negotiations in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs at the Department of State. So we're delighted to have Ambassador Barbara Bodine with us. <laughs> Very pleased to have uh, next to her John Bridgeland. Uh, he began his career in public service as chief of staff to Congressman uh, Rob Portman, uh, where he was uh, very much involved in uh, some very significant legislative initiatives, including the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, the Drug Free Communities Act, and the Tropical Forest Conservation Act. In 2000, uh, during the political campaign, he was the policy director for the Bush Cheney presidential uh, effort. Uh, obviously successful one, uh, and after the election he was the, the coordinator of the policy transition for the Bush-Cheney presidential transition team. That led him next to be director of the USA Freedom Corps, where he coordinated more than a billion dollars in domestic and international services initiatives, uh, greatly expanding the U.S. government's efforts uh, in this area. Uh, I'm sure you're going to find him a, a fascinating person uh, to deal with in helping to promote uh, civility and public service uh, in the United States. Please welcome John Bridgeland. <laughs> After John <laughs> it comes uh, Vicki Duvall. Uh, from 1995 to the year 2000, she was Assistant General Counsel for the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, during her time at the CIA, she served as the Deputy Legal Advisor to the Counter Terrorist Center in the agency's Directorate of Operations, uh, where she gave guidance, legal guidance in other words, uh, on a, a variety of issues such as overseas covert operations, criminal law, human rights, interaction among U.S. intelligence agencies, and law enforcement. She's also, uh, after that, she became the uh, former, she became the general counsel uh, uh, of, and of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, therefore having worked at both the agency on the legislative side of things and at the agency side on these critical issues um, dealing with intelligence, which are, of course, uh, very much on the national agenda. She was also responsible in her capacity uh, uh, on the Congressional Committee uh, for developing policy drafting, for example, the negotiating Title IX of the USA Patriot Act, which dealt with trying to improve intelligence and intelligence coordination. Uh, please welcome Vicki Duvall. <laughs> Last but not least, <laughs> we want you to spend the time listening to them, not me, but, uh, and by the way, these are all really brief introductions. When you go to the tables, you will find larger uh, resumes that give you more insight into uh, their careers and, and uh, their interests. Uh, but uh, finally, we have Kathleen Matthews. Uh, she's an award-winning uh, producer, reporter, and news anchor for the last 25 years in Washington, D.C. Indeed, if you've been in the nation's capital and had your television on, you are bound to have uh, uh, come across uh, Kathleen. Uh, she's a, extremely well-known and uh, admired uh, for her work there. She's uh, received nine Emmy Awards in the D.C. market. She's received a number of other awards, such as the original Edward R. Murrell Award, the George Peabody Award, the Scripps Howard Award, and the Associated Press Award. Uh, and indeed, uh, she's received the Gracie Allen Award. Uh, Not for comedy. Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 exactly. I'm about to get to that. It, it's for American women in radio and television. And, uh, uh, but, uh, and in, in the year 2002, she was named a Washingtonian of the Year by the Washingtonian Math, uh, Magazine. Uh, please welcome Kathleen Matthews. <laughs> Well, with that, let me ask each of our folks to uh, briefly just give you an indication of either what inspired them to uh, get involved in public service or what brought them and what sort of entry path they had, uh, since hopefully uh, some of you are considering uh, uh, what direction you might take in your, uh, your lives. Sure. 
I was uh, struck the other night by uh, Dean Elwood's uh, comments at, at, at the forum. If uh, some of you were here, he talked a little bit about uh, uh, his entry into public policy. And one of the things he, he talked about was that, uh, of course, he was given the responsibility under President Clinton to be uh, the head uh, point policy person on welfare reform. Uh, but there came a point in time where the political uh, person within uh, the president's office uh, said to Dean Elwood, as Dean Elwood recounted it the other night, uh, you know, when the final deal is cut on welfare reform, uh, you're not going to be in the room. And Dean Elwood said, well, why is that? And he said, because you care more about poor people than you care uh, about the president of the United States. I tell that story because um, I got interested in uh, running for public office, running for Attorney General of Vermont, after I'd received my Master's of Public Administration at the Kennedy School, uh, primarily because uh, I wanted to be uh, both the policy and political person, and then I would know uh, who to hold accountable if, if politics got in the way of the policy. So uh, I went, uh, returned to Vermont in uh, 1982 upon graduation from the Kennedy School, and uh, I had previously been a, uh, spent a fair amount as a white-collar crime prosecutor, uh, as an assistant attorney general uh, in the uh, attorney general's office in Vermont, and uh, felt that uh, both in terms of making decisions about uh, what prosecutions ought to be brought, brought forth, uh, both uh, making decisions about how one builds uh, uh, a culture of excellence in the office of attorney general, that I would have something to contribute. Uh, the attorney general in Vermont is not an appointed position. Uh, it's an elected position, so in 1984, uh, I decided to, uh, to run for it because, uh, as I indicated, uh, I wanted the authority and the responsibility to make the changes uh, that I thought ought to be made uh, in that office. Uh, someone had said to me before I started um, understanding that new political candidates ought to be given confidence, not warnings, that those least likely to succeed in political life most often do, and I think I'm proof <laughs> of that. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> Chief Justice. Dr. Blumenthal. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, my path to public service is very personal. When I was 10 years old, my mother developed thyroid cancer, and I'll never forget uh, visiting her hospital room and seeing on the door a big skull and crossbones and menacing words that read radioactive. She'd been given radioactive iodine to treat her cancer, and she'd become too hot to handle, too hot to give a child's kiss. I remember the fear uh, at the cancer and the helplessness, and it was at that point that I decided to become a doctor. Uh, I spent my uh, teenage uh, summers uh, working at Stanford Hospital, learning how research was done. Um, I spent one summer at the Stanford News Bureau of the medical school learning how uh, science and medical advances were communicated. And I chose my college curriculum with medicine in mind. My first year of college, my mother developed breast cancer, in my last year of medical school, the disease metastasized to her spine so that she could no longer walk and lost control of her bodily functions. Well, uh, I vowed uh, then and there uh, that no other woman should have to suffer the way she did. She lived long enough to see her daughter become a doctor. But uh, in, uh, after I finished my uh, training in medicine, I went to the NIH uh, to uh, do a research fellowship. And began to learn that uh, women's health issues had been neglected, uh, that women were excluded from many of the research studies, that when we did prevention education campaigns to educate about the dangers of tobacco or to eat a healthy diet, uh, it was all being targeted to men. Uh, so I learned that there were a number of issues that as a medical student I wasn't trained for, because in medical school we're trained to treat one person at a time but we're not really learning about certain skills or getting the skills needed to um, address the health of a population, our communities, our nation, our world. Uh, and that's what took me to the Kennedy School of Government, where I have a master's in public administration, um, because I wanted to get those skills uh, at the public health school, at the Kennedy School, uh, at the public health school, at the business school. And uh, then went back to the NIH, um, where I joined the Public Health Service, and I stand with 6,000 other officers on duty 24 hours a day to fight international enemies like cancer, AIDS, and terrorism. But our weapons are education, immunization, antibiotics, and the other tools of public health. It's been an honor to serve. Uh, I was one of the people to help expose the inequities in women's health in the 1980s, and then was appointed as the country's first deputy assistant secretary 
uh, of women's health to fix it, to weave a focus on women's health through the fabric of all of our federal agencies and to work with the private sector to improve women's health. And now uh, I'm working on global health issues and also uh, trying to uh, apply technology to improve health care. So that's been my uh, personal path to public service. Thank you very much. Ambassador Bodine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know quite, I, I have always had um, an interest in politics and the outside world and I'm not even quite sure where both of those came from, but growing up in the west end of the San Fernando Valley I had absolutely no idea what somebody could do with that. Um, in the San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles is practically a foreign country and um, I was very lucky between my junior and senior year of high school that I was involved in a special class and diplomats from the consulates in Los Angeles came out to talk to us. And I suddenly discovered that there was this world out there where you could combine an interest in politics and uh, the international world as, as a practi practitioner. I, I just did not know what you could do with it. And I decided at the age of 16 that I wanted to go into the Foreign Service. Um, for me, I wanted to be, what, it, what attracted me to the Foreign Service was that uh, we were the, the prime actor on U.S. foreign policy abroad. Um, if, I will say that when I joined, I will date myself, uh, we had a very unpopular war going on overseas. And a lot of my colleagues and I um, spent time protesting outside. And there was a part of me that said that this felt really good, felt very satisfying, but I also knew that I wasn't really making any difference. And that uh, to really affect some change, um, I really needed to become part of the, the process. I have to say that I, I have, was in the government for over 30 years. I thought I was going to be in for 10 years. Uh, it went by very quickly. And to spend uh, your life being able to try to advance U.S. national policy, U.S. national interests, uh, U.S. national security interests, as well as U.S. national values overseas has just been one of the most tremendous opportunities I could ever have had. Um, looking back, uh, I have no idea quite how I ended up going from Los Angeles all the way to the Middle East and now back again uh, because my final launching point into the Foreign Service was just down the street I'm a graduate of Fletcher. Uh, so I, if we had football teams, I know we would be crosstown rivals. But, um, <laughs> uh, and I certainly you know, look forward to talking to anyone who is interested in the Foreign Service, working abroad for the government, and trying to advance and defend um, this country from the front lines. John Brinsley. Thank you. Thank uh, many good things begin at the Kennedy School. I actually was a freshman uh, in the college here intending to major in history and literature and I uh, had the occasion to take an American government course from James Q. Wilson who was a very inspiring professor here and also uh, Richard Neustadt who was at the Kennedy School. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to be a, a student liaison uh, or participate in the Institute of Politics because it wasn't as well organized at that time but um, Richard Neustadt was here and he inspired me greatly through his forums and uh, the activities uh, that he led. It was through that process that I discovered, uh, quite frankly, that most of, of my heroes in life had been people in public service. I'm a Republican, um, but I grew up listening and, and watching the tapes of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and seeing what Robert Kennedy tried to do in the 100 poorest counties across America and, and what Martin Luther King was doing so effectively, uh, illustrating the power of one citizen to transform our culture and our world. And I actually reached out to a man I admired greatly, Ted Sorensen, who I understand was a fellow uh, last, last year. year. Um, it's all kind of incestuous, I guess, yeah. Phil. But, <laughs> and asked him what someone ought to do who was my age, to, what, what were paths to public service. And he wrote me this beautiful letter back saying that um, go work for a, a member of Congress or support a, a, a major candidate running for public office for, for president. And I actually did both, and uh, fortunately had the opportunity to become President Bush's director of his White House Domestic Policy Council and served in that capacity. And then after 9-11, uh, I was in the Oval Office with the President, 
And he looked at me and he said, I want to create a culture of service and citizenship. And uh, after a moment of panic and terror, I went away and we came back and created something called the USA Freedom Corps, which is um, engaging millions of Americans in service activities across the country, including um, uh, meeting the new threats on homeland security. And I'll just say finally that it, uh, Cokie Roberts had made the point to me at one point, through national service, through government service, we can affect and have a profound impact nationally and internationally on so many issues. And I've had the blessing of having that experience. Um, and I just want to say, looking at these student liaisons in particular and the students involved in the Institute, um, I am so happy that I have an opportunity to reconnect with the Institute and with Harvard and to work with them to foster a culture of service in the next generation. So thank you for having me. Thank you, John. Vicki. Well, I'm, I guess I'm glad I've gone after uh, these people because uh, I, I uh, have a far less um, noble reason for uh, being in public service. I'm learning more about public service and why I wish I had wanted to be in public service <laughs> when I first be became involved in it from being here. Um, and I'm um, having the opportunity here to reflect more on my career in the past and what my career will be in the future, I hope. But um, my path to public service was very selfish. It was, uh, uh, I went to law school and came out of law school and, and well, for lawyers at that time, one of the best places to work was Washington, D.C. if you didn't want to just do the run-of-the-mill corporate kind of law, which I didn't want to do. Um, so I came to D.C. and worked as a lawyer in a law firm for several years and was able to do government type work and it was very interesting legal work, um, often on the other side of cases from the government. And uh, then I took several years off, quite a few years off with my children when they were small and didn't actually start working in government until the Clintons, uh, as we like to call them, came to Washington. Um, and I was very excited about that and my kids were reaching an age where I thought, I wanted to go back to work, um, and I had an opportunity to, to go and work for a couple of years in the White House Counsel's Office in the Clinton White House, and that led happily to uh, several other opportunities, and I chose to go to the CIA uh, because, again, self-interested. I thought it sounded very interesting, and it certainly was. Um, but again, I was still a lawyer um, and doing legal work, but uh, I became interested in intelligence policy from my work there because I could see so many serious, serious problems, and many of them are coming to the public attention now through our uh, reflections after 9-11 and all the, the studies that have been done. But these are problems that many of us were very, very concerned about uh, long before that. Um, and then I had an opportunity to leave CIA and go to Capitol Hill. And then as, that's really where I became what I would consider a policymaker. Uh, uh, staff on the Senate Intelligence Committee or any committee or staff for any, any members of Congress really are policymakers because they're working with their bosses and their committees to develop law um, and you need policies in order to decide how, to, how you want law to develop. And so I was able, fortunately, in that role to uh, 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 implement, uh, uh, even before September 11th, through the laws that we put out from our committee, many of the problems that I and my colleagues had seen at the agency. Um, I also had the opportunity to staff John Edwards when he first came on the committee in January of 01 um, and got to know him very well and worked with him and traveled with him abroad uh, for the Intelligence Committee. Um, and that has also been very rewarding and has led to me becoming more involved in po politics, pure and simple, than I would have been otherwise. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. Uh, Kathleen. This is an amazing group of people. I mean, we've been here two weeks together. We've become fast friends, and you know we've learned so much already from each other, and it's fun just hearing everybody talk tonight because we continue to learn, which is the great thing about being here at the Institute of Politics. Um, my path to the news media came through politics. I was a freshman at Stanford University. I was pre-med. I had worked at the Stanford Hospital, but never ran into Susan there <laughs> as a candy striper. And within one semester, I knew I was not going to continue to be pre-med. It took a calculus and an organic chemistry course to tell me that I had to go in another direction. Um, I had actually volunteered at the campus radio station because I thought that would be a fun thing to do. And I was spinning records. This was the tail end of the Vietnam War, 1972, and there were lots of protests on campus. And I had gotten involved in my freshman dorm 
as one of the student organizers for those protests. I was very much uh, against the war, wanted to see the country get out faster than we were getting out at that point. And so I was with thousands of other students as we were having a protest on campus. We were heading down to the public area, sort of like going down to Harvard Yard here, and the action was to take over Route 1, El Camino Real. <laughs> and I sort of thought, you know, we're going to get arrested if we do this. <laughs> and I wasn't prepared to get arrested. Meanwhile, a friend who was working at the campus radio station spotted me, recognized me from spinning, spinning records at the radio station, and said, hey, do you want to help me cover the story? And he handed me a tape recorder and a notepad, and suddenly I was a member of the news media. <laughs> and I felt more comfortable there. I wanted to report on what was going on. I thought that what the students were doing should get attention. I didn't want to be arrested as part of that, but I suddenly saw a role in the news media as showing what was happening, bringing attention to the anti-war protests. That wasn't quite my epiphany, though. I continued to be involved in politics, working for the local congressman, a Republican who was opposing Nixon on the Vietnam War. And through, his, um, through my work with him, I uh, got very, very involved in po the politics of the time, not only the anti-war protests, but also later on what was going on in Washington in terms of Watergate. And I wish Ben Bradley was here tonight. Ben is one of the fellows, and, and his mother-in-law passed away, so he's not able to join us tonight. But Ben Bradley soon became my god. This was a, ga a guy that was standing up, standing up for good government, a, a, a democracy, and the way government should be. And he was doing it not within government, but outside of government in the news media. And I saw that segue between sort of a sense of wanting to be involved in, in public service, making this a better country, and a role that I could play in terms of doing that within the news media and the fourth estate. I credit Ben Bradley with the fact that I moved and found my major in journalism. I would read those Watergate transcripts, those Watergate reports every day. I mean, that was what I sort of lived on through my college career. And so it's really a fellow fellow <laughs> that is responsible for where I am today. When I look back, it was probably that first epiphany of feeling more comfortable in the news media than I did as a anti-war protester. And I've actually come here to the Institute of Politics looking for that second epiphany as I see my industry changing so dramatically. I mean, in the 25, 30 years I've been in the news media, we have seen so many new sources of news with 24-hour cable, with the internet, and that is transforming my industry by the hour. I mean, there have been greater changes, I think, in the last four years than there were in the 40 years prior to that. I want to figure out where we're going, what kind of a role I can play in that, and I think in a dialogue with young people, you get challenged, and I think that'll help me see my path and maybe help me steer my industry into the new millennium. Well, thank you, Kathy. And I think she's almost launched us into <laughs> sort of our next uh, question or round of uh, conversations here is, is for them to describe briefly uh, uh, and give you just a flavor of what they hope to accomplish in their study groups as you choose uh, which ones you wish to attend. And, um, and then you'll have more intense chance to talk with them uh, uh, as we break up the session. So, uh, Chief Justice, we'll start with you again. We'll just go down the line. Uh, as Phil indicated, uh, in 1997, I was nominated uh, as uh, Chief Justice of the State of Vermont by, uh, by Howard Dean. Uh, within a year of that, uh, my taking the bench, uh, we had before us uh, the state constitutional challenge, uh, the challenge to the uh, constitutional prohibition on same-sex marriage in Vermont. Um, for those of you who uh, may have seen Justice Scalia last night, uh, he said uh, that a living constitution, uh, he used fairly strong language. I think he said a living constitution made him ill. Uh, <laughs> I can imagine his response to uh, my decision in Baker. That would, uh, <laughs> uh, but the fact is that uh, in interpreting a constitution as a living document, um, there are certain consequences and there are certain uh, impacts. And my purpose in uh, presenting a study group entitled Law, Politics, and Same-Sex Marriage is uh, not so much to talk about the legal analysis, though we did a little bit of that today in our first session, but to bring uh, to the Kennedy School uh, some of the folks that were involved in uh, this very extraordinary dialogue that took place in the state of Vermont where really for the first time uh, uh, an entire community uh, discussed both publicly and privately the impact 
of uh, homosexuality on American life, of claims of individuals for same-sex marriage, and the consequences uh, of uh, the civility of that dialogue in terms of moving uh, the, the social consciousness forward on, on that issue. So from uh, uh, the legislators uh, who were actively involved to uh, some of the uh, reporters and the uh, editor who won a Pulitzer Prize, uh, to Governor Dean, uh, for whom it was, uh, I think, uh, significant both in terms of personal and obviously uh, professional and uh, uh, political consequences. Uh, the purpose of our session is to look at the Vermont experience and see what it has to teach us about uh, what will happen in Massachusetts and the rest of the country. So I look forward to uh, anyone's involvement and participation. Great. Dr. Blumenthal. Thank you. Well, the writer Emerson once said, health is the first wealth. And if you think about it, health is the foundation upon which all of our lives are, are built. And in the 21st century, health has humanitarian issues, economic implications, national security ones as well. Uh, over the past century, there have been great challenges to health as well as enormous progress. If you, we were to walk together through a graveyard in the year 1900, we'd see on the tombstones that that people on average died at age 48 of infectious diseases and also, if you were a woman, of complications of childbirth. But thanks to the triumph of public health interventions, including sanitation, uh, better nutrition, uh, food and safety, uh, environmental legislation, providing access to health care, immunizations, the human lifespan has been extended by 30 years in developed nations. However, uh, in, and I think that we've also seen in the past 50 years probably the greatest advances uh, in the entire history of medicine, 1952 with the discovery of DNA, followed by the discovery of uh, the microchip and later computers. It's revolutionized the way that uh, clinical care is delivered and the way research is conducted. However, despite these dazzling uh, advances in biotechnology and the information age, the truth is that many people in our country and in the world are living in what I would call a health deficit. And I think that uh, uh, we see, we know that socioeconomic status is the most powerful predictor of health worldwide. Then in 2001, with the anthrax attacks and terrorism, we learned that we'd grown very complacent about public health in our nation uh, and worldwide. Uh, because while we'd gotten so focused in on mapping the human genome and the possibilities for transforming the treatment of patients, we'd forgotten the public le health lessons of the past that had given us these bonus years of life expectancy in this century. Uh, but the fact is that for many people, in fact in 38 countries worldwide, life expectancy has actually declined. Uh, infectious diseases remain uh, major killers. In fact, they kill 1,500 people every hour in the world. One out of four deaths worldwide is due to infectious disease like AIDS or malaria or tuberculosis. But in the 21st century, we also have new challenges, new diseases that have emerged as a result of human behavior, creating technology, modifying our environment, and that modifying the diseases that affect us. We're hearing about things like monkeypox and SARS. Well, 32 new diseases have emerged since 1972. And infectious diseases and other conditions have always been decisive shapers of history. Now there's the obesity epidemic, tobacco use, um, that are responsible for over one out of five deaths worldwide. So there are many challenges that face us. With international trade and travel, our world is shrinking, and the spread of an infectious disease like SARS or AIDS, the threat of uh, bioterrorism, the spread of tobacco, or fast foods, they don't know any state or national borders. Uh, but while problems cross borders, so do solutions. And that's what our study group is going to be all about. And I look forward to interacting with the students here um, in the study group to think about what kinds of interdisciplinary solutions are needed to face the challenges ahead. Because in the 21st century, we, uh, have, we have the ability to create new strategies because we have the public health lessons of the past, but we can marry them with advances from science and technology to respond to the issues again. Well, Madam Curie once said, I never see what has been done, I only see what remains to be done. Yes, much progress has been made in advancing health in the past century, 
but I think the greatest triumphs against disease are still ahead if we together can bring together these various perspectives to create 21st century solutions. Thank you. Um, mine's not quite as lofty as that. Um, <laughs> Um, I certainly hope you do succeed, um, <laughs> and 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 I and I didn't and I didn't get as far as even pre med. Um, I, as I said, have spent my life as a as a practitioner of policy overseas and primarily in the Middle East, and I think we're all very much aware that just pick up any newspaper and almost all of the front page and going well into the paper um, has to do with issues in the Middle East from the Middle East having to do. The, one of the issues is, however, I think that too many people in this country don't fully understand uh, what the Middle East is, uh, who it is, and what we're dealing with. And I think that there's uh, a similar lack of, of appreciation and understanding coming the other way. Um, I would like to, but don't think that I can probably solve that in the next uh, two and a half months. But I would like to examine with those who wish to come to the study group what are some of the issues that have both prompted this lack of, of understanding, mutual understanding, and what are some of the avenues that we might use in order to bridge these, these misunderstandings uh, in terms of policy and programs, um, the use of the media, uh, the use of various um, education programs, and see if there's a way of bridging this, this gap or finding ways for those who are going to be the next generation of practitioners to bridge this gap. Oh, good. Uh, my seminar is on presidential decision making, how America's CEO functions in the Oval Office. Uh, it's just been a week and we've already had a, a great time uh, working with the student liaisons and the people who attended the first seminar. Um, this seminar will look at the key roles that are played by the president's domestic, economic, um, political communications, legislative, uh, budget, and other advisors, and how literally the president functions today, it also trace and tell us something about the evolution of the presidency from basically being what Jim Wilson and others called the chief clerk of the country, uh, with some uh, fairly powerful exceptions, to what it is today, which is an agenda-setting president. Uh, at the same time, it will tell us a lot about presidential power, but it will also tell us a great deal about presidential weakness when it comes time to actually prosecute and implement that uh, agenda that the president and the administration has set forth. In the process, we'll hear from the executive director of the 9-11 Commission and the leader of the bipartisan uh, Ford Carter uh, Election Reform Commission in the aftermath of the Florida recount. We'll hear from the person who really created um, the faith-based initiative and, and helps us define what God has to do with the American experiment. We'll hear from uh, top legislative budget um, and other aides, including the uh, very popular Ari Flesher who is uh, the, formerly the president's press secretary and will tell us what it's like to be in that terrifying moment every day uh, before, with all due respect, Kathleen, before the White House press corps. Um, we'll also, as a subset of this seminar, which is very exciting, the students will be leading a college service initiative, which will be looking at the institutional policies and practices across the country in a representative sample of institutions that are systematically trying to engage more students into service through admissions, campus clearinghouses, fellowships, scholarships, graduation commendations, and postgraduate fellowships um, to award and inspire and hopefully incentivize other colleges around the country to do what Harvard does so exceptionally well, both in the college, the law school, and the business school, which is support students who want to be literally enlisted into systematic and regular <coughs> service um, to their community and their country. And I hope and that any of you who would like to attend do so, and, and we'd love to have your uh, active participation. Um, my study group is called the Politics of Intelligence, um, partly because this is the Institute of Politics, and I thought I should put the word politics in the title <laughs> of my study group. Um, but it is an interesting uh, title to me because uh, intelligence, I was trained, is supposed to be apolitical. Uh, what intelligence officers do is gather information, analyze it with no bias, political or otherwise, and provide it to the policymakers who then use it as they see fit to make policy. 
um, and intelligence officers do uh, view um, policymakers, whether it be the president, cabinet secretaries, members of Congress, uh, and other people in the executive and legislative branch as their customers, their consumers, and they call them that. And uh, so to have this politics of intelligence concept is, is really um, uh, somewhat of an oxymoron, but what has happened, as we've all seen, is that intelligence has come to the front pages of the paper and the op-ed pages almost every day. And it, uh, there are more and more leaks for political purposes, which will be one of my topics, one of my weeks. Um, and uh, it, it, I think it's time that people actually understand a little bit more of what, what intelligence is in America. What, why do we have a CIA in, in an open democratic society? Can't the State Department do that for us in a more open uh, way? The State Department does a great job, but I don't think anybody would want uh, the president or uh, a cabinet secretary to go into a meeting with a foreign country only with the information that the State Department has been able to acquire uh, above, above the uh, ground. They also want to go in and know exactly what they hopefully will have stolen the policy talking points of the person they're meeting with because the CIA stole it for them. So they'll go into the meeting knowing exactly what they're going to say, not what they want us to think they're going to say, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a partnership. Um, State Department performs a function, but you also need a clandestine service. Um, and so my goal is to uh, help people understand uh, what, a, what clandestine services do, how they do it, what analysts do, how they do it, and then also look at, you know, because this is an age of reform in this area, look at some of the reforms. I don't want to focus too much on the reforms because it's hard to talk about reforms if you don't know what you're reforming. So we'll, we'll sort of get to that point in the later part. But there are certainly a few reform issues that we want to talk about, and I'm hoping to have, an, and I expect to have a 9-11 commissioner for one of my later study groups to talk about that. I can see from Ambassador Bodine's uh, body language, uh -oh. there might be a difference of opinion here, but that's something you can pursue after the fact, <laughs> right. and this will go on all semester. Right. Uh, Kathleen. We can talk about some of that later. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no problem. Too, is, my bad. We, we want that stimulation. <laughs> the interesting thing is the overlap, too, and the extent to which you know we each sort of cross each other at various right. points in what we're, what we're doing here. Um, I said I had gotten into uh, uh, TV news um, because I saw it as a public service, and I've had a great career, 25 years, uh, all of them with the local ABC station in Washington, D.C. Our motto is seven on your side, and that sort of, I think, captures the public trust that uh, drew me to, to local news and kept me in local news. Um, in local news, you're very much a part of your community. You're reporting on a smaller group of people and a smaller area, but you're also very much involved in that. And in the course of my career, I've gotten very involved in a lot of charity boards as stories I've reported on have turned into invitations to speak at public functions, do you know, charity events, and then ultimately serve on those boards. And it's been a great career. And in fact, most people still get their main source of news from their local TV station in America. And if you look at presidential campaigns, you see the candidates going into those local markets, trying to do the interviews with the local, um, you know, the, the local TV anchors in those battleground states because they know that that local news function is still very important. Half of all Americans have local news as their primary source of news. However, the audience is declining. There's so many more choices. And I look at my own children, who are all teenagers, they don't watch local news. They don't watch network news. They don't, watch, they don't read the Washington Post. They go online and they search and find the news they're interested in. They watch cable. My husband is on MSNBC. He does a show called Hardball. My kids watch MSNBC. And in fact, most young people today are getting their news from cable and from the internet. Now, in the old days, when you got older and you bought a house and you started paying taxes, you'd start watching your local newscast and you'd start watching your evening newscast. But the projections are that young people will not make that transition. They will continue to get their source of news from the new technology. And what is that new technology? Well, you know, we don't know yet. But I mean, the Microsoft came out this last year, this last spring, with this big screen TV that also services as your computer screen, so that what you could have is a big screen in your living room, that's where you could do your online um, you know, uh, work, but it also could be the source of your TV news, as more and more TV news is available through the internet. And that is the future. And so all of us in the news business are scrambling to figure out how old media is transforming to new media. 
Um, one of the producers that I've worked with over the years is just walked in over here, Jennifer Donaldson. She was actually a Kennedy School um, uh, mid-career student here. And Jennifer and I worked on a, a show together. Jennifer's father, actually, um, has had a long-time career, Sam Donaldson, in TV news. Mm -hmm. And he was grousing this year that he was reporting the news on a cell phone. Well, that's the future. I mean, here's Sam Donaldson, who for many years was there in the White House press room on the network newscast every night. Now he's on a new digital channel that ABC has pioneered that you can watch on Sprint or on your BlackBerry. I mean, that's the future. News, whenever you want to get it, however you want to get it, at your convenience 24-7 through your computer. In fact, we're in an age where pretty soon you could program your own TV network of the shows that you wanted to watch when you wanted to watch it as Microsoft takes TiVo technology and combines that with a digital server and you basically program whatever network you want. How does that change the kind of news we get? How does that change how we work as a democracy where we used to have basically the same source of news, we used to watch the network newscasts together as a country, where we all can go wherever we want for so many other sources of news. And so that's what my seminar is going to look at. And it's going to be very much a conversation because People in my industry are trying to figure it out. I mean, we are looking at the new technology, and we really don't know what our news is going to look like in 10 or 20 years. So I'm going to be bringing in um, Rick Kaplan, who's with MSNBC, had been with CNN, and was with ABC. I'm going to be bringing in David Weston, who's with ABC News, president of ABC News, who has now just launched this brand new digital, digital cable channel that is available if you have a digital uh, uh, cable TV set and digital service and is also now broadcasting on Sprint telephones. Um, I'm going to be bringing in Joe Trippi, who's one of the other fellows, uh, together with a guy who's a super blogger, to talk about the world in which not only will you search and find and be able to blog text, but you'll be able to go out with your cell phone, which has a camera, and take pictures of breaking news and put it on the internet and have your own channel that you're putting on or contributing to some other channel. So sort of what is the news going to look like and what are the implications when you have this unvetted news arriving at people's doorsteps? And we're going to try and figure that out. Well, if you don't think you have enough choices <laughs> already from what you've seen this evening, uh, Kathleen has alluded to two of our other uh, uh, fellows for this semester who uh, uh, both unfortunately could not be with us, although he had originally planned to be here uh, this evening. Uh, ben Bradley, as she says, the famed uh, editor of the Washington Post, who uh, uh, most famous for, uh, of course, the Watergate disclosures that actually uh, had a transforming effect uh, in American politics, uh, and he will be back with us. Unfortunately, a death in the family prevented him from being here uh, this evening. And also, uh, you can actually see the other fellow on the television over here, uh, Joe Trippi, who has been alluded to. <laughs> Most recently, uh, a long-time experienced uh, a campaign operative uh, and who has been particularly engaged with the internet and the new technologies, but obviously was the campaign manager for Howard Dean uh, in the spring. He will be here. We happen to be extremely fortunate that uh, we actually got two for one on this fellowship because his wife, Kathy Lash, uh, is here, and she will be here this evening at their station uh, and be able to answer questions. She has extraordinary experience uh, of her own, uh, particularly in, in working in the press operations of political campaigns. And so, uh, frankly, uh, you should be pummeling her with questions, just as you should any of these folks. And indeed, we want to encourage that. The, uh, we have the structured um, uh, meetings, uh, the study groups. We hope you'll sign up. We hope you'll want to go to uh, them on a regular basis. But I might as well uh, give away the secret that all upperclassmen in the college know and all second year uh, Kennedy School uh, folks know is because attendance is not required, of course, in these. Uh, you can sample them uh, and switch from week to week and find uh, the, the, what interests you, uh, and uh, I hope you won't miss out because, as I hope you gather, we have some extraordinary folks here. Uh, and, uh, and the whole theory behind the one, this major program in the Institute of Politics when it was founded back in 1966 was to ex create an experience that you can rarely get uh, in, in most places in this country, and that is the opportunity to, in a persistent way, engage with people who uh, uh, have been and all these people will be 
uh, engaged in major uh, public events in this country and, uh, and to uh, learn from them on a personal basis and on a professional basis. So please uh, seize the day and uh, take advantage of them and we encourage them to engage with you and every fellow we've ever had here at the Institute says it's an extraordinary experience uh, uh, and the most important aspect was engaging with the students. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to bring this piece to the close. Uh, the this room's going to be slightly rearranged, and we hope you'll stay around and you have an opportunity more seriously engage. But there'll be lots of other opportunities to get information over the semester for what we're doing. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.